All right, let's get into it. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. I hope you've been reading Matthew 5, 6 and 7, the Sermon on the Mountainside. Jesus took his disciples, he took a crowd up onto a mountain and he preached to them. Um, it's the longest sermon that we at least know of have recorded. Incredible. Starts with what blessing looks like. Uh, finishes with building your house on the rock. And we're right in the middle. Um, there's a passage about when you give, when you pray, when you fast, where you should store up your treasures. And last of all, uh, this week I'm preaching, uh, if you're in an NIV or something, it'll sort of be saying, do not worry, something like that. And uh, I'm going to read to you. And so the reason we're preaching about spiritual battles uh, is because of God telling us last year when we were praying, God, help us grow as a church. The Lord said that you need to grow up in four areas first, the area of finances. So we spoke about that. The area of conversations, being honest, dealing with sin, moving forward in the kingdom. And so we did a month of series on that. On atmospheres, we did a month series um, about commanding the atmosphere over our church, over our life. And lastly, the last thing God said, we can't grow as a church until we learn uh, more and grow in the area of spiritual warfare. The Bible is very clear that we do not wage war against flesh and blood. Do you know that? Your argument's not with your boss. Can I get an amen? Your argument's not with your neighbour. Your issues aren't with your pastor, your husband, your wife or your kids. They are spiritual battles. They are fought in high places. The Bible says there are powers and principalities in high places that are working against us. I'm going to read a fair chunk of scripture this morning to you because I want the Bible to speak to you. Oh, is that right? We still still believe the scripture is the living word of God, living and active, able to discern or slice between soul and spirit, bone and marrow. Um, I don't want what you believe to rest on something I said, but what on the scriptures say. And so I'm going to read to you quite a large chunks of scripture this morning because I'm speaking about discerning the battle. The Bible has mountains to say about spiritual battles. Uh, many of us are kind of trapped in some sort of world reading the Bible. We think it's all about love, clouds and baby Jesus. And that's all that we want it to be about and those types of things. But the Bible is abundantly clear that we are in a spiritual battle that Christ has won for us on the cross. By the breaking of his body, by the shedding of his blood, he took captive those powers. The Bible says he paraded them through the streets in a parade of shame to show his glory and his victory over them, yet they still come and try to disturb our lives and take our lives off track from the Lord. That's the biggest frustration for me as a pastor. And so I've taken the passage from the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 6 to read to you but I want to just share some thoughts um, from out of that and obviously some other scriptures. So here we go. It says, therefore, so I'm reading from verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, about your body, what you will wear. Is life not more than food and the body, more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and, let, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the fields grow? They do not labour nor spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, in all his splendour, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And that's the end of uh, this little section that we've concentrated on this month. For me here, church, this morning, the key verse is this. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? 
Come on, church, is life not more than just eating food and getting dressed? These are very physical, practical things. There is a spiritual life going on all around us all the time. Yet we're always constantly concerned with what we're going to eat, what we're going to wear, who's going to talk to us, and, and all these types of things. And they consume our thoughts on a daily, um, hour by hour, moment by moment, uh, situation and we have got to realize that there are far greater things going on in a bigger spiritual battle the whole passage is not about worrying uh, and stressing about the day-to-day -day. you know James actually says when it comes to worry that God did not give you a spirit of fear and it doesn't say did not give you fear we all can manifest fear um, I have to climb up to the top here every now and then to do stuff when the lights um, on a device that we affectionately know as the Tower of Terror. And so I do it because I'm the least likely to sue the church if I fall and break my legs. Um, and so, but when I'm on the Tower of Terror and, um, and the youth are moving it for me and it's swabbling or whatever, I have it some fear. That, that's a healthy thing to have, a little fear. I could fall and break my legs. God gives us the ability to kind of calculate that this could be concerning. But then there's a spirit of fear. People who are constantly afraid of situations, constantly afraid of the dark, constantly afraid of sleeping, constantly afraid of confrontation, constantly afraid of going in the ocean, constantly afraid of going to work. That is a spirit of fear. And the Bible um, goes on and on and on to us and, and we just seem to, I don't know, it's like these scales on our eyes talk to us about all of these spirits. Spirit of fear, spirit of death, Come on, spirit, unclean spirits. All, and, and the Bible just continually is informing us that there are these spirits out there that want to work in our life. Spiritual warfare is not treating spiritual problems in the natural. I find so many people who have a spiritual problem, they can't discern that it's a spiritual problem and they try and fix it with natural means. How many of you know you will not fix a spiritual problem with natural means? Also, uh, similarly, I find that people are trying to over-spiritualise natural problems. I love it when people say, oh, I think there's a spirit, um, you know, trying to damage my health. I have a headache. Every morning when I wake up, I have this same headache. And it's a spirit. And so I talk to them about, well, why do you think it's a spirit? And, you know, find out a bit about their life. And then I find out that they drink copious amounts of alcohol every night stay up until 3 a.m. and then wake up with a mystery headache every morning that must be a spirit. And I'm thinking, you are over-spiritualizing a natural problem. We do it all the time. Is it true? We say, oh, um, you know, I'm just so undisciplined with money, it seems to slip through my fingers. No, you have a spirit of poverty over your life. There's something working to rob you every day. And you think with a little extra discipline, which I'm, I'm saying is not a bad thing, that you'll fix the problem. It is a spiritual battle that you are fighting. In reverse, having a headache every morning, people think, oh, there's a spirit of, spirit of headaches or something on my life. I think, no, you just need to stop looking at screens, stop drinking, go to bed on time and look after yourself and you'll be right. And Christians seem to struggle to discern the battle that we're in. And so the Bible's trying to wake us up to that this morning. These demons or spirits um, affect their emotions, their attitudes, our flesh, they appeal to our ego, to our soul. Man, there's a thousand ways that they can get in. Um, this, you know, spirits are always trying to work on me through my ego. I have an ego, I admit it. Um, it's a problem, I'm dealing with it. And, and so I always find if there's any type of spiritual battle going on, for me it's in my ego. Um, I don't normally get discouraged in my soul, but many of you do. There are many of you here today I know get very discouraged in your soul and so those spirits try to uh, work in that soul realm. Many of us have um, issues of the flesh. We just enjoy the pleasure of this life way too much like that's all there is. And so those demonic things can get a hold in those areas. And so we can all be pros, church. Come on, are you right? Are you believing me this morning? I'll let the Bible speak in a moment about the actual issue, but... Jesus said this to Peter. He said, Simon, Simon, Satan has come that he might sift you like wheat or sift you like chaff. 
You know, the devil just wants to sift away until he can say, oh, there it is. There's the problem in that guy's life. And just begin to work on those things to draw us away from God. We are in a spiritual battle and church, we need to wake up. We need to wake up. There are sometimes, uh, you know, disunity in families and groups. We've got to wake up. Because that is there, has been sown there by Satan, has been sown there by the devil to consume your family, to consume your marriage, to stop you in your ministry. We need to wake up, church. There are, is a spiritual battle. The Bible says there are powers and principalities seated in high places. And that, that is where the war is at. And we've just got to kind of snap out of that whole, um, you know, I know that God is love. 1 John 4, 8 and 4, 16 says God is love. And I know that is the, the thing that we need to preach. That through his love, he's had mercy. And through his love, he sent his son. And through his love, he offers salvation. I know that. But it's not the only message in the Bible. And the church has got to wake up in this area. Churches are getting better and better. I've said this ad nauseum the last few months. Better and better at worship and writing. There are more songs written than ever before today. They're getting better and better facilities, you know, at least in the Western world. Um, more, more resources. They're getting better at communicating the gospel. We're getting better at so many things, but we are not getting better at discerning spiritual battles. And that is where the enemy is going to bring the church down in the decades to come if we cannot recapture what it means to do spiritual battles with people. Is that all right, church? Are you right? You're quiet on me. Come on. Are you okay? You want me to keep going? Come on, guys. There's a spiritual battle going on for you and your household and your family. And so this morning I've got some scriptures. I'm going to read a, a fair chunk. I might stop and make comment on them, but I want for you to get a sense that the Bible is constantly speaking about this issue. The Bible is constantly making us aware that we are in a spiritual battle. And if you're not reading your Bible, I encourage you to do whatever you need to do. Even that's a battle. I don't understand how people can concentrate for five hours straight on television or Netflix, and then they tell me when they open their Bible, within 30 seconds they're distracted, frustrated, and everything else. Tell me if that's not a spiritual battle, church. Tell me how it is you can concentrate at work for eight hours and then you open the Bible and all of a sudden your mind is going crazy. Tell me that is not a spiritual battle. Tell me why isn't it the other way? Why isn't it we're consumed with passion, zeal for God's word, like a laser beam focused for hours and hours. Your parents are saying, kids, put that Bible away for goodness sakes. I'm tired of every time I come around your head's in the Bible. You've got to stop it. Watch some TV. That never happens, does it? Come on, guys. It's a battle. It's always, oh, I've been trying so hard to read my Bible, but just find it so hard and all those things. Yet I just say to myself, there is spirit. There is a, a spirit at work trying to stop you from the life that comes from his living word. It's, it's sowing life into you. And so your job maybe can make you passionate, but it's not going to give you eternal life, church. Come on. And so I, I, I think, why do these things happen? Why is it people can never miss a volleyball game, but they can't get themselves to church? It's a spiritual battle. There's spirits at work in your ego, in your soul, in your flesh, right? In your mind. All of those things are going on all of the time. Why is it that um, when you drop your kids off at someone's house and they, you kind of, you know, talk about spirit of fear, how were they? And they go, they've been perfect. You go, oh, I knew it. I knew it. Why can they be perfect for someone else and not for me? Why? Because the devil wants your children to hate you and for you to hate your children. That's what he wants. And so he wants to paint a picture that everything's good at someone else's house, but it sucks at home. Because the devil hates your family and he's in a spiritual battle. Revelation 18 talks about the whore of Babylon, the spirit that runs this world. And I can't even, it's in 18, someone look it up for me, but it says... And talks about all the trading and all the merchants that will stop. Trading in cinnamon and spice and frankincense and chariots and horses and, and gold and silver and all these things. And then it goes on and just happens to add this little gem in the end. And trading in the souls of men. You know, the devil wants your soul. 
Come on, guys. The devil wants your soul. He wants your children's soul. He wants, even if he can't get your soul, to limit your impact in the church and in the world. He doesn't want to see another person saved out of your mouth. He doesn't want to uh, allow you to produce fruit in any way. He wants to capture you and imprison you. And so it talks about in Revelation 18 somewhere about that, that spirit of Babylon. There's a spirit of Moloch. There's a Jezebel spirit. There's spirits mentioned. I don't have time to go into it over and over and over and we're just not seeing it church we're just not capturing it that this is a spiritual battle that we're in the bible teaches that angels are not exempt from judgment church paul said to the corinthians do you not know that we are also to judge angels do you know we're going to judge those dirty spirits that have been sent to work against us praise god for that now, come on we're going to reign in judgment over them it says, uh, that's in 1 Corinthians 6. If you want the scriptures, ask me later. I'm, I'm, getting in, I'm getting on fire, so I don't have time for all the details. And when he saw Jesus from afar, so this is talking about the demoniac. There was a guy chained hand and foot living in caves, which is an unclean thing to do according to those times. And uh, Jesus arrived, uh, the sea of the Gerasenes, and out comes this demoniac. And uh, out of his mouth says, what have you come to do with us, son of the most high God? And I am here to tell you that demons are real. Uh, they are people. They have a name. Jesus said, what is your name? The demon said, we are legion for we are many. And so it's very clear to us. The Bible says that Jesus went around doing good, casting out demons and healing the sick. That will never change, church. Nothing ever changes. Everything always stays the same. People will always need to hear the gospel. They'll always need to be delivered from demons. They will always need healing. They will always need to fit into a church body. Those things will never change. I don't know if I need to read that now. Uh, and Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged Jesus earnestly not to send them out of the country. One of the difficulties of living in this life, church, come on, it's, it's not just convenience. It's not just uh, culture or social pressures. People tell me, oh, I'm under so much pressure and uh, it's so hard, uh, you know, not to do this or not to do that in the culture I live in. I know, I live in it too, right? But the thing is, you've got to build yourself up every day and every night. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Read the Word. Get with other Christians. The Bible says to be baptised in the Spirit daily. So we, it's, it's on us to continually build ourselves up. I told you very clearly two weeks ago when we preached on fasting, I do not know any other way to build yourself up but speaking in tongues, praying in the Holy Ghost. Paul said he did it more than anybody else and yet we marvel at his life. It's not against the inconvenience and the pressures and the cultures. It's against fear. It's against weakness. It's against slumber. It's against jealousy. It's against lust. Our enemies, church, are demons. I don't know, some of you are looking at me like this guy is a nut job. Well, so be it. But the word of God is very clear that there are demonic spirits all around us. They cause murders, they cause breakups, they cause illnesses, they cause all these things. When we let them, when we do not discern the spiritual battle, when we decide to put a, a greater emphasis on their abilities than God's ability, when we let them, they take ground. When we command against them in the name of Jesus, they have no hold on us. Is that all right? Our enemies are demons. Paul said this, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places, church. Satan, Satan presented himself before God in the book of Job. If you read the book of Job, I encourage you to read it. Job chapter 1. It says, and the angels presented themselves before God and also Satan presented himself before God. And there's this short conversation. And where have you been, God says. It's almost the answer, well, you know. I've been roaming around on the earth looking for opportunity. Looking for ways to divide churches, to divide families, to harm people. 
roaming throughout the earth, it says, back and forth on it. Where have you come from? Satan answered, Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Come on, church. Satan is real. Come on. If you're visiting this morning, I'd like to say I apologise, but I don't. I love you too much uh, to not speak the truth. I don't preach about this stuff often, but we need to address the church. There are demons out there. There are principalities out there. There are spirits of fear. There are spirits of murder, of death, of poverty, of sickness, of depression. Stop thinking it's all about, you know, I, I, I'm enjoying the latest hashtag, living my best life. Anyone hashtag in that one? Stop it. <laughs> there is a war going on out there. You think you're living your best life by, you know, uh, power of positive thinking or whatever. You know what? We are in a spiritual battle. We should be hashtag winning my spiritual battle, right? That's already been won for me. Maintaining that victory that God has set up for me. Um, sorry if you've been hashtagging that. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. You know, often we find ourselves saying, I'm, you know, I'm just having such a bad day or such a bad month. No, there are devils out there sifting your life like wheat. Stop making it like it's a thing of fate. Oh, I've just had such a rotten month. Yeah, well, oh, well I wonder why. Do you think God has been cursing you? I don't. Do you think there have been spirits and powers and principalities wanting to, to destroy and, and disarm and, and derail your life? I do. I think that. Every time you have a nightmare, I think that. Every time you get depressed, I think that. Every time you get frustrated and sin in your frustration, I think that. I just think there are things around wanting to divide us and to make us captive to them. Is that all right? You're being oppressed. You're not having a bad day or a bad month. You are being oppressed by demonic powers. That's what's happening. When you tell me, oh, I just find it so hard to read your Bible. Yeah, because you are being oppressed by demonic powers. There's no other way for me to say that to you, church. Listen to this. That was um, somewhere, Luke 22, 31. And God was doing extraordinary miracles at the hands of Paul. I'm in the book of Acts now. So that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick and their diseases left them and wait for a church and the evil spirits came out of them. Come on, the Bible just keeps promoting this idea that there are evil spirits at work on people, in people, through people, around people, seated in high places, roaming around the earth in low places. Wherever you look, I'm not concerned about them, but the point is we need to discern the battle. We need to know that these things are happening. Evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. I always enjoy this Bible verse. It's just a scoundrel in me. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. So, so this high priest named Sceva had seven boys and they thought, right, we've seen Paul doing uh, incredible things in the name of Jesus, we're also going to do it. So they say, we adjure you in the name of Jesus to this guy with a demon inside him. And this is what the demon said, Jesus I know and Paul I recognise, but who are you? And it says, and then the man in whom there was an evil spirit leapt on them, mastered them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. So they said, all right, we know how to do this. In the name of Jesus who Paul preaches, I, I, I bind you. And the, the spirit said, well, Jesus I know and Paul I'm familiar with, but you guys are going to get a whooping. Uh, because I have power over you. Come on. It says that they seven sons got flogged and stripped and sent out church. For those of you who just think the devil attacks your mind, not so. 
Um, I've got, I don't know, Kim, Kim can maybe, thanks Kim for everything you do by the way, and Lance, Lockie. This is, I was talking to Pastor Graham last week saying, oh, I've, I've uh, you know, feeling very proud of myself. I've, I've managed to, um, you know, become aware of 10 spirits in the Old Testament and 20 spirits in the New Testament. And he said to me, is that all? So um, he said, there's hundreds of them in there. So I don't have time, obviously. I just want to make you awake, make you aware. Look at that. A deaf and dumb spirit, an evil spirit, a familiar spirit, a foul spirit, a lying spirit, a perverse spirit, a seducing spirit. That's a good one. Um, if you want me to send them to you, I can, but you can Google them. Google will help you with everything. You don't need any discipleship. You just need the internet, and you'll be right. Spirit of an unclean devil, spirit of the Antichrist, spirit of bondage, spirit of death, spirit of divination, spirit of error, spirit of fear, spirit of haughtiness, spirit of heaviness, spirit of infirmity. How many people you know that just constantly sick, unwell, struggling? And, and look, by all means, see the doctor, see a naturopath, care for yourself, eat right, drink right, sleep right, exercise right, do all that stuff. But sometimes you have to discern the battle. Sometimes it's worry that's killing you from the inside out. Sometimes it's demonic oppression that's killing you from the inside out. And it doesn't matter how many pills you pop or how much wheatgrass you drink, you are in trouble because there is some spirit at work inside of you. And the spirit says, Jesus I know, Paul I know, wheatgrass I don't know. A lot of you think I'm being a redneck and I'm not trying to be, but I'm just trying to snap you out of it. You are not going to defeat something happening in the spiritual realm in the natural. Someone look, I just thought of something. Someone look up this verse. It's in 1 Corinthians. It's in chapter 15. Oh, you're there. Thank you. I'm going to say mid-40s, maybe. Somewhere in there. Somewhere late in the chapter. It says, it's talking about a resurrected body. It says, first, I'm going to get this right now because someone's looking it up. First in the natural, then in the spiritual. Mid 40s? 46. Is that text not simply? Uh, the spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the that's not what I'm looking for. That's pretty good though. It's close. It says there's a natural realm and a spiritual realm. First in the natural, then in the spiritual. We're all stressed out now. It's all right, let's take a minute. 46, 47. Thank you. All right. Um... Let's just take a minute together. No, it's not going to be a different version, Samuel. All these doubters. Who's got big, big font in their Bible? Eddie. You could get my glasses out for me at least and help me. Scriptures tell us the first man, Adam, became a living person, but the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. What comes first is the natural body, and then the spiritual body comes later. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from heaven. So, church, what it's saying to us very clearly is that there is a natural realm and a spiritual realm. Are you getting that now? The Bible's saying there's an earthly body that comes from the dust, but there's a spiritual body that comes from heaven. 
There's the spiritual and the earthly. And one is not going to affect the other. You cannot conquer things in the spiritual realm in an earthly sense. And you cannot fix earthly things all the time by over-spiritualizing them. We need to discern the battle. We need to know, look, this is just an earthly problem and we can resolve it, um, you know, through earthly means. I don't need to over-spiritualize it. And we also know, thank you. We also know that what Christians are falling foul of is they are thinking that something is not a spiritual issue when it is. Can that list go back up, please, Kim? I don't think I've finished when I had that thought. There's a spirit of infirmity, a spirit of jealousy, a spirit of slumber, spirit of this world, spirit of whoredoms, unclean spirits. And so the list goes on and on and on. Thanks for my glasses, guys. Man, this is far better now. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts, listen, and the attitudes of the heart. There is a difference between bone and marrow. There are differences between thoughts and attitudes. And the devil wants to try to sift and work out how to oppress your life in one way or another. Church, we've got to wake up. We're involved in a spiritual battle. Things are not going to change by changing jobs. They're not going to change by reading, you know, a parenting book or something. Yeah, by all means, educate yourself. I'm never against those things. I'm never against getting equipped and getting the increase. But the reality is, until you pray for peace over your family, because there's a spirit there that wants to wreck your peace, until you pray for deliverance, until you pray for healings for hurts, until you pray for bondages or generational issues or things there, you are not going to get the victory by reading a book or by saying pleasant things. Yes, there's power in the tongue, but these spirits are not going to leave you until you work out you're in a spiritual battle. When I got saved um, in May 98, Paul and I, I had addictions and spiritual bondage on my life, I did not know it. I, I wasn't aware of it because my spirit hadn't been born again. I, I wasn't able to see these things. I'd rationalise that they were normal or okay or everyone does them or whatever. And after we gave our hearts to the Lord, um, I thought I'd become ill, sick, food poisoned. And I began throwing up. And uh, you can ask Paul about it. It went on for days and days. And I was throwing up for days and days, throwing up nothing. Paul is like, you're still sick. And I'm like, well, I, I don't know, there's nothing coming up, but I'm just Bleh. all the time. And I realized, I had no grit to understand this at the time, but I realized now that God was delivering me from all of those demons. They were coming out one after the other after the other. I had a pornography addiction. I was an abuser of alcohol. I had a lot of um, hatred and judgment in my heart about situations and all of these things are spiritual battles, right? You don't fix them with diet, you don't fix them with sleep, they've got to be cast out. And God in His mercy just began throwing these things out of my life until I spoke to someone and they realised, oh, you're probably getting delivered from all of that stuff. And it is real. Spiritual battles are real. When uh, 11 years ago, when I was working here in this church and our senior pastor was leaving and I was praying about whether I should take uh, the position of the, the senior pastor or not, because it's not for me to say it's God's will, whether God wants a man or woman or who they want. And even every year, I've got to say, God, is it still your will for me to be here? I'm holding things back. Am I holding something down? Am I stopping something? It's not, it's not my church, not my ministry, it's yours. And you, you have to decide when it begins and when it ends, all right? Seasons, it's okay. So I'm up there um, on the paddock up there, which is now the sports oval, and I'm walking back and forth. Some of you heard this at night, praying. It's one o'clock at night, I'm just praying, and I feel and sense this other, and can see this other person walking alongside me. I don't know if they're for me or against me, but I'm walking, I'm praying in the Holy Spirit, asking God what is His will for me in this season of my life. And as I'm walking along, I begin to get concerned about what it is that's walking along to me. And I feel God say to me, you'll soon know if it's for you or against you. Oh, no, okay. 
So I'm walking along, and about 10 minutes later, I just begin to pray a bit harder, and it speaks to me. It says, if you take on the leadership of this church, I will destroy your family. That was the precise words. I thought, it's not for me. Um, that became very clear. <laughs> That's against me. And you know what? In some part, I have seen the devil try to work in my family, but God is greater than the threats of the enemy. Amen? So I bound that thing. I said, you foul thing in Jesus' name, and it was gone immediately. I don't have to fall on the ground and freak out that some demon spoke to me. But the point is, they are around. They are active. They do speak to us, and they do have plans and plots against us, and if we're not aware of them. So I've had to learn to pray um, and, and ask God to, to protect my family because it's a spiritual battle. I can't go into panic mode and start thinking, oh, don't go out and, you know, only do the, and all these things, try to control them in the natural realm. It's a spiritual battle. And, you know, the kids are all strong now and, and things have changed and the devil hasn't been able to accomplish his will. Isn't that interesting? The devil is so forthright in saying what he's going to do. They're just idle threats unless you make them something more than what they are. He threatens, I'm going to do this in the hope that fear will grip you or discouragement will grip you. Or here's the greatest uh, problem we have, unbelief. Unbelief. Well, well, was I really called? It's been quite hard in ministry. I guess I wasn't called. It's a spirit of unbelief. And so we need to learn to discern the battle, church. That's all I want to say to you guys. Many, it says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, many in these days will be tricked and led astray, wait for it, by evil spirits. The spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow, wait for it, deceiving spirits. And things taught by, wait for a church, demons. Such teaching comes through hypocritical liars whose conscience have been seared with a hot iron. If you give the opportunity, spirits will come and torment you. In Genesis chapter 4, the first murder has been committed. And God actually says, um, you know, to us today and to Cain at the time, Sin is crouching at your door. Church, I'm here to say, don't open the door. <laughs> it doesn't say knocking down the door. It doesn't say that evil is waiting to overpower you in your house. It just said it's crouching at the door. Always looking for an opportunity. Looking for some unforgiveness in your heart that it can latch on to. Looking for some unbelief in your heart that it can latch on to. It's not overpowering your house. It's just crouching at the door. And I encourage you, discern the spiritual battle. Ask yourself why you can watch five hours of TV without blinking, but can't pick up your Bible. Ask yourself why. Ask yourself why you're struggling with your kids or with your spouse. What is it? Is it a spiritual battle? Discern the battle, church. Discern the battle. Yes, keep your love on, church. We always have to keep our love on. Yes, keep full of truth. We need more and more truth. The Bible actually says, gird yourself with the belt of truth. Grow in truth every day. Understand more and more truth every day. Yes, keep full of the Spirit. Read the Word. Pray. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Do all those things. Yes, but I've got to add this too. Discern the battle, church. Why don't you stand with me?